right. So, here we are, uh, we are back and uh, we are trying to understand uh, how the amplitudes were dealt with in this uh, study by Wies and co-workers. As discussed, they said lambda v is to be 5 centimeter nanometer, where the assumption was that there is no contribution from the electron. So, a n v is the, ampli the normalized amplitude is equal to chi n e. The entire thing is because of uh, hole of electron and then we are looking for uh, another wavelength which is designated a n i r. There is no reason to call it n i r actually, it could be a visible wavelength also for all you know, but it is called n i r because it is obtained from the well, we are working with these amplitudes remember and these amplitudes came from the n i r uh, region. Okay. So, this a n i r yeah. Yeah, NIR is probe, even VIS is probe. So, what is the wavelength where there is 50 50 contribution? So, as you will see, we will derive something and from there we will uh, arrive at what lambda NIR is as well. Okay. So, st start with this AN at NIR is equal to AN at NIR contribution of that from hole plus contribution from electron, that is very uh, simply put. And then what we are looking for is this a n n i r equal to 0 0.5 chi n e plus 0 0.5 chi n h 50 50 contribution. Okay. Now, see you have two equations a n v is equal to chi n e and a n n i r equal to 0 0.5 chi n e plus 0 0.5 chi n h. Now, remember what is the definition of uh, chi? chi is the contribution of electron or hole right to the nth mode of decay right so irrespective of the wavelength chi will remain same for a given value of n this is uh, important to understand in fact when i read the paper for the first time i did not understand this so it required some time for me this it, to sink in are we clear about that it does not matter uh, which uh, wavelength we take as long as we are working with the same n, the chi respective chi should be same, chi n should be constant, uh, chi n e should be constant, chi n h should also be another constant, clear. Now, see, now if you simplify this, we already have a uh, work, workable formula for chi n e, is not it, because this amplitude a n v is, is an experimental quantity. Can we get an expression? for chi n h in terms of the amplitudes, what will it be? It is quite simple, take this value of chi n e and uh, plug it in here. So, you will get a n n i r is equal to 0 0.5 a n vis plus 0 0.5 chi n h. So, what will be the expression for chi n h? Yeah. Yes, but I am proving the same n that is what we are saying. So, what we are saying is that a particular n value stands for a particular decay mechanism. Now, that shows up in all wavelengths, all probe wavelengths, at least many probe wavelengths. We are looking at the contribution of the same mechanism of decay in lambda vis as well as lambda n i r. See how did we get all these uh, time constants by a global fit across the wavelengths, right. So, the basic premise of the work is that there are certain fixed decay mechanisms and effects of these can be seen across the uh, probe spectrum. So, as long as you work with a particular value of n, chi n e is the same irrespective of the probe wavelength chi n h is the same irrespective of the probe wavelength. That is the basic premise of this work and that is the part that may not be very easy to understand when we start. Are we convinced? Because otherwise, you cannot say that 4.5 picosecond is a particular decay mechanism. 4.5 you get from all the wavelengths, right. As we saw earlier, it shows up in TRPL, it shows up in uh, transient absorption visible, it shows up in uh, n i r as well. That is uh, exactly the point. This is a comparison between time resolved uh, photoluminescence and transient absorption fitted independently. 
and that is the beginning of the story. Fitted independently, they get a very good match. First of all, where did six time constants come from? Three came from one experiment, three came from another experiment in PL itself. Now, when they do transient absorption again, uh, picosecond and nanosecond, they get actually the same time constants. This mismatch is not much, and what what is very prominently absent in transient absorption is 0 0.73. So then, uh, that is why they got encouraged, and they looked in NIR. And when they did uh, global analysis of the NIR data, then they got the same time constant. Of course, they would get the same time constant because they fix the lifetimes. But the reason why they are they justified fitting the lifetimes is that in any case everything is coming the same. The only problem is that in this time constant, if you take 5 instead of 6, this 0.73 and 0.45 you get this sum over i, i tau i kind of thing and the time constant becomes less than 4.5 as you go from higher to lower energy probe. Okay. So, uh, the basic premise is that the time constants are the same irrespective of the experiment, irrespective of the uh, probe wavelength. Otherwise, this analysis cannot be done. Yeah, th this is where we were. We said we are going to put an NIR equal to 0 0.5 an vis plus 0 0.5 chi n h. So, what is the uh, expression for chi n h? Chi n h equal to, yeah, no, but then that has to be divided by 0 0.5 also. A n NIR minus 0 0.5 chi n e divided by 0 0.5. So, you get this chi n h turns out to be 2 a n i r minus a n v s all right now using this what one wants to work out is eta n e so eta n e turns out to be so you understand what we are doing right we have got the expression for chi n e we have got the expression for chi n h in terms of measurable quantities that is amplitudes, normalized amplitudes. So, just plug in the values. In the numerator for this expression, well you get a n v s instead of chi n e. In the denominator, you get a n v s plus 2, what is this? 2 a n n i r minus a n v s. So, in the denominator a n v s minus a n v s cancel each other, you are left with 2 a n v s, a n n i r sorry. So, finally, you get the expression eta n e is equal to 0 0.5 a n v s by a n r. Okay. Right. Now, what we want is this lambda n i r. How will we find that lambda n i r? In fact, I have given you the answer already, it is 1170 nanometer. How will that be obtained? We just look at the amplitudes. Basically, plot the ratios of a n v s and a n n i r. What we are looking for is eta n e to be equal to half. When will eta n e be equal to half? When this ratio of amplitudes is equal to 1. So, what they did is they plotted this uh, ratio of a n v s and a n n i r and they found that it becomes 1. So, uh, you understand what it will be, right? A n n i r. Uh, well, a n v s is basically the same throughout and this is a n n i r. You see there is an inflection here. So, basically the inflection point is the 50 50 point. In fact, you do not even have to do the uh, ratio from this plot itself you can see this inflection you see the inflection right. So, that is where it is and we can work with that safely because it is only from whole relaxation. Right. So, they determined that lambda n i r equal to 1170. What is the next step? We have all this, we have this 6 time constants, we have the expression for eta n e, we have the expression for eta n h and uh, we already have said that 0 0.73 picosecond is ultra fast cold relaxation. And we know the uh, lambda v's and lambda n i r's. Now, what remains to be done is work out the ratios of the amplitudes okay, of Vs and NIR and then get this percent electron to percent hole ratio. 
oh well you can get percent electron or percent hole here for whatever reason they have written it as percent electron to percent hole which is a little strange because you get numbers like 0 that is okay but as you will see you will also get a number that is infinity so i don't know why they wanted to take the ratio it, they could have just written it separately but then it's their paper not mine what can i do so you understand what's going on here right see lambda v is lambda ni are a specific wavelengths using them what we work out is a wavelength independent contribution of electron and of hole to each and every uh, relaxation process. So, we say that relaxation process number 1 0.73 for that electron contribution and that I can say without doing anything percentage electron contribution is 0 percentage hole contribution is 1. So, that is what we have started with that 0 0.73 picosecond is the whole relaxation. And then as we go from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you will see that uh, percentage contribution of electron will increase, percentage contribution of hole will decrease until at the end you will have no contribution from the hole at all. Are we clear? What is the need of working out this 50-50 point? The need of working out 50-50 point is to arrive at this formula. And this is the formula that takes us to chi n e which is wavelength independent and from there well that is basically what we work out. So, this is the result and here you might notice that uh, instead of f i basics only one is taken this is just a sum of the two uh, only one is taken because first of all that contribution is very small and they mean more or less the same kind of thing. Uh, look at the last line and neglect this strange notation. Let us read the numerators first and then the denominators. Percentage electron contribution for the first pathway is 0, for the second pathway is 11 percent, for the third pathway 23, fourth 85 and fifth and sixth 100. And whole contribution is 100 for pathway number 1, 89 for pathway number 2, 77 for pathway number 3, 15 you see the dramatic change here from 77 it goes to 15 when when you go from 48 picosecond to about 700 picosecond 700 picosecond is uh, well of the order of nanosecond. So, at the moment of uh, well at the point of transition from ultra fast dynamics to fast dynamics you see there is a significant changeover of relative contributions of electron and hole and then this one is uh, electron all the way. Okay. So, to explain this what they considered and you will see why they considered this, they considered three kinds of populations of nanocrystals and three kinds of populations means one population with one kind of distribution of electron and hole trap, second with another kind, third with another kind. We will see where all that comes from and why. Okay, another thing if I forget please remind me at the end uh, to say uh, what more could have been done or what more should have been done in this paper and I want you to find out whether that has been done in the 9 years that have passed between publication of this paper and today. All right. So, this is what you have the time constants and the contribution what is numerator what is denominator very easy to remember because if you remember the first component is only due to hole. So, denominator is hole numerator is electron. Okay, let us go one by one let us look at the first component first component we do not even have to think it is hole relaxation. So, what would be the meaning of hole relaxation this yeah what it essentially means is that there is a population I mean there is a large population where the hole is actually not on the highest level it's somewhere down below. That means, the electron has been uh, taken out from a lower energy level while exciting and that hole floats up that is a relaxation. Okay. So, to start with we should write that tau 1 as 1 by k r 1 plus 1 by k n r 1. Yeah, But I hope you will agree with me 
if I erase one of these terms it will be the denominator. Can I erase K R or K N R? What can I erase? K R right here only hole is involved. So, hole is going from one level to another level there is no question of emission of light ok it is just relaxation. So, I can just erase this. So, actually it is 1 by K R 1. Now, the uh, convention that is used throughout is uh, K R or K N R is written and then uh, you write the uh, a number in sequence of appearance of that nothing else. So, this uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 that we write here is not necessarily correlated with this 1, 2, 3, 4 and that is another point where we can get confused ok. One needs to be careful about that. In the first one there is no problem because both are 1, but later on you will see things will get jumbled up a little bit ok. So, first one is accounted for whole relaxation. What about the second one? Here what is the contribution of electron? What is the contribution of whole percentage? 11 percent electron, 89 percent whole ok. So, you can safely say 11 percent electron means uh, whatever is in excess electron or hole that is being trapped you can think like that. You have 11 electrons you have 89 holes this is what is involved in the relaxation pathway. So, what will happen the model that is being used is that 11 electrons will radiatively recombine with electro 11 holes and the remaining 18 minus 11 78 holes will get trapped. Am I clear? Yeah, 11 percent electron, 89 percent hole means if you have 100 excitons, you are handling here. Uh, well, not 100 excitons, 100 carriers. 11 electrons are there, 89 holes are there that are relaxing through this pathway. So this 11, 11 electrons will radiatively recombine with 11 holes, and the remaining 78, 78, right? Yeah. 78 holes are going to uh, get trapped because that is the only way they can get relaxed by themselves ok. This is definitely questionable because who has said that uh, out of the 11 electrons 4 do not get trapped right. So, this is one problem with trying to do so much of detailed analysis ok, but it is still it is a uh, commendable approach that one uh, can learn from ok. So, so, this is one problem in fact, I wanted you to tell me I have told you uh, the answer. So, the problem is this here after doing so much of calculation finally, you are working within the ambit of some approximation and the approximation is that if you have a smaller number of electron or smaller number of holes all of them relax by radiative recombination that actually may not be true. Justification for using that is that you have 78 holes that are getting trapped as against 3 electrons getting trapped you neglect the 3 electrons ok. So, the, this is definitely an approximation that is being used. So, do not get the impression that it is an absolute perfect uh, approach lots of approximations are actually involved ok. So, I can draw it like this. Let us see what I mean here. First of all, this uh, whole relaxation has already taken place in the first 730 femtosecond. Now, from here, two pathways are there. One is radiative relaxation. You understand what this means, right? These two lines at the bottom, these are energy levels in the uh, valence band. This one is the lowest energy level of the conduction band. This here is a hole trap. This here is an electron trap, and we are working with shallow traps. That is another approximation. Why do I say we are working with shallow traps? Because there is no red shifted emission right. If there were deep traps would not you expect uh, P L that is red shifted there will be significant change right. But if there are shallow traps electron or hole then whatever whenever the, those trapped electron holes recombine the energy involved will not be very different from the uh, bandage recombination energy. Yeah, that is why these are all shallow traps that is that comes from the uh, steady state spectrum. So, this is one pathway the radiative pathway now recombination has taken place that is why you do not see 
uh, electron or hole. Electron is de designated as a filled circle, hole is designated as an empty circle. Okay. So, this one is given the name Kr2 and this is where the deviation from uh, this notation up here begins. Well, uh, not really because th this is true that is also true, we will see where the deviation comes. Do you understand Kr2? Kr2 is the rate constant associated with the electron hole recombination in this kind of a situation. So, this is bandage electron hole recombination okay. and that is associated with what kind of time constant? Something like 4.5 picosecond time constant, right. The other thing that is there is KNR2 where the hole gets trapped, all right. So, that is one thing and this is labeled fast hole trapping and the need for using the uh, adjective fast will be apparent uh, in a few minutes. Have you understood this diagram? Yeah. Well, this is the, the diagram that is easy to understand. Later on things get a little messed up, little bit of hand waving is there. Okay. Now, let us go to the next one, 48 picosecond time constant, electron contribution 23, hole contribution 77. So, if I go by the previous uh, treatment, what does this mean? It means 23 electrons radiatively recombine with 23 holes and 77 minus 23, 54 holes relax by themselves, right. So, what kind of diagram will I get? Similar what I drew earlier, what will change? Instead of writing Kr1, Kr2, I have to write Kr3. Yes. So, this same thing what we write is that tau 3 is equal to 1 by Kr2 plus Knr3 and this is where the deviation begins actually. So, see the here it is Kr2, here also it is Kr2. Why? Because in both the cases the radiative process is electron hole recombination at bandage. There is no reason why we should use a different rate constant there. However, the uh, non radiative rate constant is definitely different, right. Trapping is definitely different because time constants are different by an order of magnitude. In the first case, we are working with a 4.5 picosecond time constant. Now, we are working with a 48 picosecond time constant, 10 times more. And we are saying that the radiative rate constant is the same in both the cases. So, obviously, non radiative rate constant is going to be different. Will it be larger or will it be smaller? For population 2, will so we have the names, so you can use the names KNR3 is it larger than or smaller than KNR2? Yeah, smaller, smaller than KNR2 smaller rate constant is associated with a longer time constant. Okay. So, smaller rate constant means what? Slower, yeah? basic chemical kinetics. If rate constant is small, the process is slow. So, here this is called, this hole trapping is called slow hole trapping. Why would we have a fast hole trapping and a slow hole trapping? What could the reasons be? This I think you can tell me. First of all, it could be different traps, different kinds of traps where the hole is getting trapped or it could be different density of traps. You can have in population 1, perhaps there is a large number of hole traps. In population 2, there may be a sm smaller number of hole traps, right. That is why it is called population 1 and population 2, yeah. KNR2 is smaller, KNR is not slower or faster, time constant is slower or faster. You can say well everything is smaller and larger. What I am saying is tau 3 is large, larger than uh, tau 2 and if you look at the expression in the denominator tau 2 has KR2, tau 3 also has KR2. So, now my question was KNR3 and KNR2 which one is larger. 
since tau 3 is larger k naught 2 has to be smaller it is in the denominator that is what I am saying smaller smaller rate constant is not faster smaller rate constant is associated with a slower reaction rate equal to k multiplied by concentration. So, if k is small rate will be small so slower actually so the process will be slower yeah. Yes. It's almost same thing as more than tau. Yeah. So uh, even if the K N R three is, uh, is uh, I mean smaller than K N R two or something, still I don't think it will be like three times or something uh, less. Than it can be. I mean, uh, we, there is no restriction on what the values of KNR two and three are, right? Here, here there are uh, more number of electrons, so they could they can combine the whole. Uh, I mean, more quickly uh, than the. Uh, no, so that is not the model that is being used. The model is that whenever you have bandage recombination, bandage recombination is independent of number. To be honest, bandage recombination is one electron, one hole. Forget everything else. That kind of a situation. So, bandage recombination have to have the has to have the same lifetime. When trapping takes place, it is not so easy for the electrons and holes to recombine radiatively, that is why it slows down. That is why when uh, say copper is introduced or manganese is introduced, lifetime goes from picosecond to hundreds of nanosecond, because they are like physically separated, right? They are on different entities, but not in this case, it is in the same particle. In the same particle, when you have an electron and hole it does not matter what it what the situation is in another particle. Do not forget lesser number of holes means what? What we are saying is that we have done one photon excitation. So, in a single particle there is only one electron hole pair. All we are saying is that the distribution is different for a particular relaxation pathway. Total number in any case is same over the ensemble, but how how many holes are combining with how many electrons in a particular pathway that is being discussed. And the case of a trap is different because in in, in one nanoparticle there are many trap states. So you can talk about in a single nanoparticle you can talk about a greater density or a lesser density of traps. So even for one exciton, number of traps is going to alter the rate. But bandage emission, recombination of an electron and a hole in valence band and uh, your conduction band that is constant. Constant means that has its own distribution that is why you get a lifetime yeah that is independent of anything else. That is why the uh, radiative rate constants have been taken to the be the same. Are we clear now? This is not trap if, if it was a trap emission then what you are saying would be definitely correct. All right. So, this is uh, population 2 and in fact population 3 is very much like population 2 when I show it you will see. But let us go to uh, this nanosecond time constant now. So, we are going to picosecond to nanosecond now there will be a, a more fundamental change. What happens here 85 electrons 15 holes what does that mean electron trap right. So, what they did and it is not very clear why they did not want to do it from another population why they did not use a fourth population what they did here is that well there is a reason why they did it I will tell you what they did is this but just now now just go with me and see what they said then we will come back to that. They said that this tau 4 originates not here but here tau 4 originates in a in nanoparticles where the hole is already trapped and the reason why they say it is that now here the radiative constant is different because second to nanosecond right. Now, we come to a situation that you are referring to just before this here for a nanosecond decay radiative constant cannot be associated with a uh, bandage electron hole pair it must involve a situation where one of the carriers is trapped. So, here you see a different radiative rate constant is used K R 3. 
So, k r 3 is much smaller as the lifetime is uh, time constant associated is much larger. So, 1 by k r 3 plus 1 by k n r 4. So, what will happen? One thing that can happen is that first of all these two can recombine and this recombination is different from the recombination in the earlier stage because it involves a trapped hole that is why the time constant is much bigger, it constant is much smaller. The other thing that can happen is this electron can get trapped. So, you end up with nanoparticles where electron is trapped, hole is also trapped that is bound to happen. So, now you have created a situation where both are trapped. So, if there is any ultra long lifetime in PL that will come from here. Okay, because if these traps are completely isolated, they won't even recombine. They have to sort of come back to the core, and then only recombination can take place. Okay. Similarly, the next one was associated with population two, exactly same kind of situation, and then population three. So what they're saying is that there are different kinds. So the so basic processes are only of three kinds, okay. but there are different kinds of population with different density of traps that is what shows up in the uh, different time constants in nanosecond time scale. Picosecond is justified by the fundamental trapping and bandage electron hole recombination processes. Okay. So, this is a uh, this is what they did. Now, can you tell me what you honestly think about this analysis? Do you think it makes sense? Do you think it is all rubbish? Or do you think it is somewhere in between? So, what I think is that uh, this model is uh, it requires further verification, it is a good model to start with, but it may not be complete. How can one try to uh, complete this study? What I would think is this is uh, a situation where one can take resort to simulation. When I say simulation, I do not mean protein folding and all that, nothing to do with that. What I am saying is that in this kind of a numerical you can do it with things like MathCAD and now I am sure there are better uh, software for this. Uh, what one can do is you basically you will want to be able to fit the data just like fitting is already done. What you need to do is you need to uh, guess values of tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, tau 4, tau, tau, tau 5, tau, tau 6 right and then vary them until you get a good fit look at them and see whether they make sense. Not all good fit will give you time constants that make any sense or rate constants. So, this is something that uh, should be done in cases like this. Actually, the story is incomplete. Did the story get completed in the last 8 years? I leave that uh, to you to read up and see. An easy way of doing it is to see which papers have cited this paper, go through them and see whether this has been complete. Also, uh, these people actually published a college endum later on. I would like you to read that up as well. And read this paper, it is a good uh, example of how one can handle very complicated uh, ultra fast time resolved uh, absorption and emission data. That way it is instructive and uh, it is not necessary that uh, the understanding generated from the data analysis is restricted to nanoparticles. It can actually be extrapolated to other systems, molecular systems with uh, comparable or more or less complexity. Okay. So, that is what we wanted to say here. Uh, so far, we have talked about exciton dynamics in semiconductor nanoparticles, that is only the beginning of the story. So, in the next uh, two or three modules, we are going to talk about uh, dynamics of multi excitons and maybe just touch upon a very recent uh, paper that has been published uh, on uh, other kinds of carriers that are there, polarons, trions, and so on and so forth. Perhaps we will not go into too much of detail of that, but at least we will mention what they are and what has been seen. But multi exciton dynamics uh, is something that we definitely want to talk about and that is essentially a single paper by Klimov.